Thank you, Irene. And now we will move on to Paul Meilmeyer from Nord to give us a couple more minutes of comments. Thank you. And I don't have slides, but we can leave this up here because it makes me look more official. Um, so I'm going to try to be shorter than five minutes. Um, so if any of you five o'clockers missed your flight, you don't harbor resentment against me. Um, I am just uh, have just a couple comments um, to share from Nord's perspective. And um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Nord, um, we're a national nonprofit organization advocating for all 30 million Americans with rare diseases. And we have various services uh, and, and offerings. And I invite you to go to our website if you are curious. Um, so now on to the substance. Um, I, I, I have been thinking throughout the presentations today a question that keeps recurring to me, which is how visible do we really want the UDN to be? And this is uh, solely from a, a resource standpoint. Um, I, I know within our organization, I've talked about UDN and UDP before. And we, at times, have been hesitant in really publicizing the work of the UDP and UDN, um, simply because uh, we would not want to open up the coordinating center to an absolute flood of applications, many of which might be entirely inappropriate for the UDN and UDP to, to, uh, to, to look at. So I think over the next five years, if what Bill said was correct and that there's a possibility for having three times as many patients in the next three, uh, five years as we have already in the UDP and UDN scene, then uh, what avenues should we uh, explore for better publicizing the UDN and UDP? Because I think there is absolutely the supply of patients that would uh, desire to, 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 uh, to take part in uh, the UDN. Um, however, I think there is still a great amount of unawareness around the UDN and UDP, partially uh, due to our own fault, just because we, we in the patient organization community haven't uh, fully publicized the opportunity. And uh, in, in my role, I, I am very lucky to be able to go around the country and actually talk with many rare disease and undiagnosed disease patients. And in talking with undiagnosed disease patients, uh, there are very few who are actually even know about the UDN and UDP. And I, I ask them, OK, we'll have you talk with your doctor about potentially applying to the NIH undiagnosed disease program. They don't know what it is. They just they, 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 they don't. Um, and I, I wonder if this is uh, partially due to the fact that currently UDN is only limited to certain areas of the country, certain um, metropolitan areas, and that if we were to go to, you know, Fargo, uh, North Dakota, or, or somewhere in, in Billings, Montana, that there would essentially be no, absolutely no knowledge about the UDP and UDN, and that um, there are obviously undiagnosed disease patients there. And so how better do we re reach those patients? How better do we reach those physicians? And I'm not necessarily saying we need to have a whole huge campaign to reach every single first responder out there, but maybe the second responders, um, the, the, the physicians that the, the initial uh, primary care physicians would, would contact. Um, so for the areas of the country that are not necessarily being touched by the current UDN network, I wonder if potentially the UDN sites currently within those networks, uh, within the network, could be responsible for some kind of proactive outreach to certain areas of the country that doesn't have a UDN site right now, or in partnering with uh, research facilities and, uh, and hospitals in those areas just to make sure that they're aware that there's opportunity to, uh, to, to apply to the UDN and that uh, these undiagnosed patients have that um, last, uh, last hope hotel, as, um, as Donna talked about. Going forward for the next five years, um, I already touched a bit on the expansion of the UDN, um, not just domestically, but also internationally. I'm, I'm very, very excited to be part of the effort to expand the UDN um, internationally to the UDNI. Um, and I already know there's, there's very wide patient support internationally for that effort as well. Um, we've been participating with Eurortis, with the Wilhelm Foundation, um, Can Canadian Organization for Rare Disorders has been involved in the past. Um, and I already know within those organizations there are discussions of establishing kind of an international consortium of patient organizations interested in undiagnosed diseases. Um, and that organization would be able to better publicize the needs of undiagnosed patients internationally. Um, and currently, there's actually really no equivalent even nationally. And so that's, that's something that's uh, an avenue that could be explored within the UDN, outside the UDN, possibly as a public-private partnership between, two, between the two. Um, but uh, yeah, just, just another avenue for consideration. And then one final thought uh, regarding the, the patient assistance program that, that NORD operates for the, um, uh, for the initial baseline testing. Uh, patient assistance programs are inherently just a Band-Aid. They are a Band-Aid. They're not a fix 
to, to um, an inherent problem whatsoever. This is the same with in, in therapeutics. This is the same in uh, premium assistance programs. And so the, the, the viability of uh, a patient assistance program that's funded by donations is no, by no means a long time fix. And so instead, there does need to be probably a more concerted effort to find how best to allow patients who need these baseline testing who are not able to access it to work through insurance um, to, to, to potentially, um, either through the UDN or through the uh, physicians themselves, to, to better advocate for the coverage of that genetic testing, that initial baseline testing, so, um, so, so such a patient assistance program is no longer necessary. So I'll close just, again, reiterating our support for the UDP and the UDN. I know it has very, very wide support across the rare disease patient organization community. Um, I talked with a couple of my colleagues before this meeting, and when they heard that there was even the slightest potential of the uh, UDN and UDP not being reauthorized for five years, or not even only that, but when we come to the five-year time period five years from now, and it has to find a new home that it could possibly cease to exist. That was very obviously unconscionable for most of the organizations, or uh, all the organizations that I have talked to um, over the past, uh, uh, not only before this meeting, but over the several years that we've been working with the UDP. So, thank you.